Lights out. And now the movies, folks. <laughs> get this sucker started. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the Omega Files. I'm your host, Dr. Freedom, and tonight we're going to finish up our you know, current wrap of Harryhausen movies with The Seven Voyages of Sinbad, which was their first color picture, and also the first of the three voyages of Sinbad that they did. Okay, joining me tonight is William. Say hello. Hey, now. The wonderful Johnny Blues. How's everybody doing? Philip Archer. Good evening, one and all. And Texas Tim. Hello there. Oh, yeah. This movie was pretty, pretty interesting. You know, especially when you get lines. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, <laughs> that one ain't coming up. No, why aren't you doing that? Especially when you come up with lines such as this. If you were indeed a magician, why do you not use your great power to slay the one-eyed monster? That could be taken wrong. <laughs> 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 oh yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she finds out about that when she gets married to Sinbad. <laughs> oh, okay. The the scary part is also I, I was looking up some info on the actress there about Catherine Grant. Um, turns out that off screen she was known as Catherine Crosby. Bing Crosby's wife or daughter? Yes, that's Bing Crosby's wife up till the point he died. She stayed with him all the way to seventy seven when he passed. Wow, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that either until so I was doing a little research on the movie. Oh, I thought that, that was... Mean, that means she's Denise Crosby's mother. Yep. Mm. Oh, uh, hell. From Star Trek Next Generation. Yeah, I'll never say that. You talk about Tasha Yar. Oh. Yeah. Also, yeah, Torrin Thatcher, he also yeah, he appeared in the original Trek. Um, he played Marplon in uh, Return of the Archons. He was one of the guys, I guess, who was part of the Resistance. And that's, well, most fans know him you know, for Star Trek. But, yeah, he, he did quite a number of movies. This was uh, one of the last few he did. Okay, let's go around, get everybody's opening thoughts on this one. Let's start with Johnny Blue's opening thoughts on the seventh voyage of Sinbad. Um, I can basically say this isn't my favorite of the Harryhausen movies, but it's one that it all of, all of his scenes in this film are always indelibly in my mind when I think of this movie. Um, and I think I could probably say that for most of his works, but um, I, in watching it back again recently, I found it really interesting how formal all the dialogue was and everything like that. And, uh, I, I just really enjoyed watching it again, revisiting it. And, uh, it kind of dragged in places, I would say, at, at least for my taste, but, uh, it was still a pretty enjoyable movie. Okay. Texas Tim. Yeah, I, I would echo what Johnny said pretty much. It's, um, this is probably the least of the movies that we've discussed as far as Sinbad goes. But having said that, all of the set pieces are very effective with the, the effects and stuff. I mean, so um, it's a very enjoyable movie, but yeah, the, the dialogue's a bit heavy handed. I mean, it's a different style of acting. This was in the mid fifties, right? So, I mean, it's, 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 it's dated, but I would say though, that all, all the effects scenes that were really, really well done for the time. I mean, it, it must've been amazing to be a kid to see this movie in the theater back then. Okay, Philip. Yeah, um, I just want to echo the fact of the um, the style of um, the acting <coughs> when they're trying to represent being from places like Baghdad. It, I, I, I can say that every time I cl if I let if I close my eyes and listen to the dialogue, I kept I swore I, I could have swore I was watching a western. It was too, the, the dialogue was somewhat Americanized, too Americanized in a western sense. It didn't give me that sense of all the other. Um, Sinbad film where you can tell it's kind of like you know from the Arabian Nights kind of thing this this, this was too westernized for me but and the, the effects of the monsters was a bit ropey the effects were a bit not as smooth and clean as you get with the other um, Sinbad movies but otherwise it's not a bad movie it's quite cool but you know it's not one it's not one of the better ones that he's done okay William well this is my like this is like type of the two of my favorite 
Sinbad movies. This one and the one with Tom Baker. But yeah, this if you could tell, this is 58. And this is his first movie that he does. The effects in color. In color. Because everything else he done before was in black and white. So he, he had 11 months to do all the effects for the entire movie. 11 months. Unlike others, unlike the um, the the next big one that he does, Jason and the Argonauts, that they gave him more leeway, and you notice how successful that movie is to everybody who still remembers it to this day. Um, yeah, there was uh, like like Johnny Blue said, um, there's some slow stuff, but you got to remember that that there was some special effects that he was supposed to do that was not put in. There was going to be a um a fight scene with his um devil bats. Um, Devil Bats, um, he had the models made and everything, but, but they, 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 they didn't use it. So what he did was he used those creations and put in the Jason and Argonauts as the three harpies. In the book, he showed you how they would have looked like. Hold on. Hang on, mm -hmm. All right, there we go. Mm -hmm. They would have looked like that. That was cut out. And the scene when the Cyclops is cooking one of the captured guys, Another side couple was supposed to show and fight him for that meal. But instead, they didn't, they didn't put that in and use that second Cyclops at the ending to fight the dragon, you know, to make, it, to make that battle longer because the original script had Sinbad fighting the dragon and stabbing it, which is a little bit of hard for a, a, a little sword to be able to penetrate the thick skin of a dragon. That's why they'd rather have him killed by that giant crossbow that was created. But in it, I, overall, it, to me, it, was one of, it, it is one of my two favorite ones, and it was, it's not a bad movie. for something that was made over 50 years ago. Also, I'm going to leave the floor open on this one. I, you know, I know it's their first major outing, but those guys who were hanging around Baghdad you know, running the show, they must have been the biggest idiots on planet Earth because it's like you know, every average audience member could have figured out that, wait a minute, uh, Sakura wants to go to this island. All of a sudden, the princess is this big, and the only way to cure her is to go to the island. It's like you think somebody would have figured out, oh, wait a minute, we're getting shammed here, man. <laughs> when my sister and I watched it, that was exactly, we were both like in sync, almost said it at the same exact time. Because in moments after they find her, the first thing Sinbad does is go and try to ask his help when it's like face palm. This is the guy who did it. He just threatened you the, the previous night. Are you that thick? <laughs> It's like it might as well had a big banner hanging on him saying Sakura did it. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like so. But if yeah. you remember, the funny thing is, if you would have like killed them right there, that would have ended the mood because now how the princess would have got cured right. when, when that egg was on that rock egg shell was on Colossal Island. Yeah, I know it would have. Yeah, it's a little nitpicky. I just got a laugh out of that that nobody, you know, went. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait, wait, we're being sh oh, wait a minute we're being shanghai what, what, what? <laughs> even her father that like her father immediately falls right into the role that sakura had had kind of uh prophesized that there might be war his immediate gut reaction is to be like this is a slight against me you know i'm i'm threatened and it just didn't make sense to me for him. To, he, there should have been more common sense. Put it that way. Um, yeah, one thing that confuses me was the the boy in the bottle, the genie in the bottle. It was like, give me my wish, to, give me my freedom to not be a slave to someone. Yep, yeah, he's a genie. You you can you can you you can do anything you want. You, know, you don't have to be enslaved by someone just because you're in a bottle. Yet he's he's, he's more his dream wish is to become a human boy and be a cabin boy for Sinbad. Come on, man! I'd rather stay a genie. <laughs> No, but if you notice that he was able, in the end of the movie, to me, he was still, a, he still had his powers, because he took all those jewelries from the oh. Cyclops cave and put in the ship. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, you know I, I didn't even register that properly. I, was, I just thought that he, he slaved. He was he nobody. He, 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 that she, um, he was free that he, nobody could control him. So, he, he still, so, but, so what you're saying is he's still a genie, even though he's, right. Yeah, nobody owns him no more, but, so he decided he wants to stay with Simba and learn to be a pirate. Wow, what a career! <laughs> yeah, they could have done it. They could have immediately done another movie with the little kids still there doing genie stuff. But you know, it took a couple of years before another Sinbad was made. Yeah, I felt sorry for the Cyclops because all he was doing was chilling in, on his little cave and, <laughs> and guarding his stuff, and then these guys come up and start throwing, it, throwing things at him. And it's like, you know what? What, what else was he gonna? He wasn't a bad guy. Yeah, he well, was well, he, he was a cannibal, but you notice well, he yeah, some bones there. Well, he's not a man, so he could eat. I mean, that's not cannibal. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
he wasn't technically a man, you know. It's you know, come on, he's got you know the uh, yeah, he, was hungry. he was a hungry person. Yeah, he is. But you know what? That cycle to silly. I mean, he must have known that lamp was magical and he could command it to make him food rather than rather than wait for someone to come to come to shore so he can cook him. Come on, man. He can't talk. He can't summon a genie. Hmm. A, a genie can understand no, anything. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Come on. Not the way the tight club was talking. You, you were roaring. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm kind of glad the Cyclops couldn't talk because right here in this picture, he'd been like, "Check out my nipples." <laughs> 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 it's like get off my island, man. I, I'm just sitting here trying to relax, you know, taking in some sun, and you people keep coming to try to steal my shit. Come on, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Was what was funny is that that uh, he looked like if you notice he looked a little bit like um Pam from the mythology. Yeah, he had the goat legs like that. You know, that was pretty it, funny. It, it, why didn't the wizard just shrink the cyclops, and that would have saved him a lot of trouble? That's that, that's a that's why that's that's funny. That's the funny thing. He made the girl shrink, and at the same time he couldn't think of doing the same thing to the cyclops. Mm, he wasn't that bright, was he? Oh man! Plus, you know, we had the. Um, the Cobra Lady in this one, which you know later got cannibalized to make Medusa for mm -hmm. Clash of the Titan. I don't know. I, I thought the animation on that was pretty interesting, but at the same time, it was almost like cartoony, you know? <laughs> no, but I thought it was effective. It, you're right. This, this seemed like uh, a bunch of scenes that you saw later in other movies done different, like the skeleton fight, too. I mean, yeah. I thought that was probably my favorite bit was the skeleton fight, even though, you know, they do it much better a few years later in Jason the Argonauts. Yeah with more skeletons so that's you know what what you what it seemed like this movie was a teaser for all the later movies in a way yeah you could tell you could say that because remember this was the first black i mean color movie mm -hmm. and then he, he went more out starting from then this movie onward with the better effects matter of fact uh, it says here harry Housen researched the cobra woman sequence by watching a belly dancer in beirut lebanon <laughs> Matter of fact, quote here was, smoke was coming up my jacket. I thought I was on fire. It turned out the gentleman behind me was smoking a hookah. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> and, of course, yeah, we find out later that the, the um, poor Cyclops, they made him by recycling the armatures from uh, 20 million miles to Earth. Well, if I remember, I think that was the name of the movie, wasn't it? Yes, the name of the movie, the creature was called the Yimmo. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, I haven't watched that one in a long time. I got to sit down and pull that one out because, well, yeah, I remember from that one, I, I felt more sorry for the creature than I did the human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so in this one, you can kind of sympathize with the poor Cyclops. You know, he's just hanging on his island. Everybody keeps coming to plug it. Meanwhile, you got Sakura there. He builds his big shack, sticks a dragon in front of it. It's like, wait a minute, ain't you going to share with the rest of the gang? You know, it's like, oh. Uh. That's weird that he had that dragon locked up like that. So that you know, the, you know, he had the genie before that to be able to do that. Mm. And yeah. I, had, I had to do a Hoovian reference when I sat down and watched this movie today. That's you know because I rewatched it again this morning after we got back to the house, and um, it's like I was sitting there watching that poor dragon on that choke collar, going, "You better not let Carol Ann know about this." Ooh. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. I, you know, I was driving Lady G nuts because I was like, oh, my God, imagine that poor dragon. He's hanging off the wall going, I'm going to call Peter on you guys. We're going <laughs> to <laughs> um, Also, another interesting thing I read was that the flame effect, which, by the way, mysteriously stopped working after the dragon got loose. I don't know why he just didn't toast the Cyclops. <laughs> 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 done with, by Harryhausen taking an actual flamethrower and shooting it up into the sky at night and he captured it on film and then he superimposed it onto here for the track wow <laughs> that's quite simple but effective in a way if you think about it yeah but remember, that, that was why um, <laughs> you didn't see this dragon do that when he came out of the cave because um, it was a little bit time consuming to do it again mm. I mean, he shot, he shot that, that flamethrower was going up like 40 feet in the air. So, like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he was out there shooting a flamethrower at night. So, imagine what the guys next door thought. It's like barbecue at Aries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Also, the, um, another thing that I thought stuck out in this movie was the score. Um, 
you know, even though the movie's a little bit, you know, it is their first time out with a major, you know, color motion picture like this. So you got to give them a little leeway on that. You know, this is the you know, their first time putting such a big production together. Um, matter of fact, I read here earlier today while I was out running around, I was on the phone. Um, they took them 11 months to do all the stop motion animation for this movie. That's just the stop motion animation. 11 months. Yes. Like when you see it on film, it's like, you know, you, you put all this time into it for a whopping, like, you know, one, maybe two minutes of film, you know, except for the Cyclops, you know, he, he pops up, you know, all over the place, but, um, but okay. Did anyone have a favorite part they want to discuss about this whole movie? Um, I'm just going to leave it as a jump ball. There's only four, you know, five of us here. So I have a few favorite scenes in the film um, in watching it back again. I, I loved that point where, uh, was her name uh, Parissa, the princess? When yeah, she dude. goes inside the lamp, for me, that like brought out the kid in me in a sense. Uh, yeah. The, sort of the smoke, the coloring, uh, you know, kind of the ambiance of that scene. And as a kid, if I were watching this, and I'm pretty sure I did see it when I was a kid, um, but that would have been so intriguing to me, like seeing inside the TARDIS for the first time. Uh, to bring him back to Doctor Who, everything goes back to Doctor Who, but, um, you know, I, I mean, that just astounded me, and, like, uh, the the skeleton fight with Sinbad, um, I loved that these were, even though, you know, like I said earlier, there was a formality to the dialogue and everything like that, I like that, you know, right off the bat, that, like, Sinbad, and especially the princess, they're honorable characters, that's something I always look for, uh, for, you know, depictions of heroes in cinema and stuff like that, um, that I connect with because there's that moment where uh, just as they're about to get away from Sakura and she's talking about having made the promise of uh, and figuring out that little riddle, you know, dropping the lamp into the uh, molten rock and everything. And Sinbad's kind of like, yeah, you got to keep your promise. I thought that was just a standout moment for me uh, for those two characters and the honor that, you know, they both basically uh, have as characters in the story. And then um, just the end of the movie, that whole, uh, even though it is somewhat brief, the, the dragon and uh, Cyclops fight, that standout favorite scene in the movie. Okay, anyone else? Well, I echo the skeleton fight. I thought that was really effective considering this was 1958 and it, it looked really good. And it, had I been a kid in the theater, I would have been scared to death because it was spooky looking, you know? <laughs> you know, the skeleton, you know, that's that would have been scary. Uh, there's one scene that I couldn't stand, though. It was about halfway through the movie. I don't know what it was about. Um, it, when they're on the boat in the rain and they're all acting crazy for about five minutes. Oh, that would be because um, And I just like... I was like, shut up already, really, or move on. I mean, it was It went like, on too long. It went on yeah, way too long. Really bad overacting, too, buddy. <laughs> and I was like, come on, really? I was pretty <laughs> sure they just kept cutting back to that one guy holding yeah. his head. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like. I just like. I just like how the cyclops was realised, and I actually like the bits when he when he's actually picking the people up and he's holding had them in the hand. You you actually see the people in his hand because normally when you've got things like that, they use like puppets and things that looks like doesn't look like a real person. But to me, it, it look you can actually feel that see that it was real people being held in in the cyclops hand. And no, there like, were there were models too by Harry Hansen. He moved them. There were models. Were, yeah, they look, really, they look very you, like, if, like to me. If you watch the movie on um, Twenty Million Miles to Earth, when the Yema is in yeah. the city, he picks up a guy and he waves him back and forth, and that's yeah. a model. That's not a, yeah. that's not a, that's not a superimposed photo. Okay, then. Yeah, so yeah, the stop motion animate the Cyclops and the little guy in his harness. Ah! Oh, yeah. Okay, but I also did like the scene where the guy's getting roasted on the spit roasted because that was quite yeah yeah you burn bitch burn oh sorry I mean burn baby burn. <laughs> <laughs> Sinbad, Sinbad, Sinbad! I'm on fire. My hair is catching, literally. <laughs> What's funny is that uh, um, even though you, you only see it for not that not that many minutes, that the the, the two headed rock bird was used because the and uh, this story is is from the the novel um, the second voyage of Sinbad. Ah, even though the title "The Seven Voyage" that book is different than uh, the yeah. than the uh, the second one, they just use the, the title, but it's more better. 
Well, he also grew up pretty quick, didn't he? At first, he's a couple of chicks out of the egg, right? And then you see him again no, no, later. That, no, no, that was that was the baby. The baby, the chicks was killed, and the guys was cooking it. The big one was the mama bird getting find out what happened to a chick. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That, you know, that's what, that was another major attack of the dumbass on the behalf of the crew. It's like <laughs> we've killed the even, baby. Don't you think mom's gonna come back looking? Yeah, that's, you notice know, Sakura kept looking up in the air. He said, "Where's that mama bird?" But I'm gonna hide when he when she shows up. He kept he kept looking up a bunch of times, and nobody noticed it. Oh God! So Kerr is so lucky, you know, that everybody needed him alive or something. Because the second he left me hanging in the cage, I'd have brained him over the head with that freaking lamp. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, later on, it's like, boom! It's like you left me in the cage. Oh. <laughs> and then he left those other guys. They just started drinking water and got drunk from it. Yeah, he first he told me how the water is poison, and it turns out to be like wine or something like that. Yeah, wine. It's like, you know, I would have looked down and told him, uh, you do know that what the Cyclops do in that water, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, if you see something floating downstream, that's not a log. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me going for a swim as usual. <laughs> they used it, they did the same way with um Sinbad fighting the skeleton that they did with um Jason that they, he practiced for like a couple of weeks, like shadow boxing. So they, that's why he, they got it he got it right when he was fencing the skeleton. Everything was choreographed right that way. That's one of the things I loved about that scene, the choreography. I, I like played it back and just watching it like almost frame by frame. I mean as close as you can on a DVD player, but I it, it was spot on. I, that's why it's one of the standout scenes for me, how spot on it was. Also, um, yeah, the lead actor, Kerwin Matthews, yeah, this was his only time playing Sinbad. And, but he did go on to other movies like Three Worlds of Gulliver, uh, Jack the Giant Killer. Um, and the thing is, when you look down the titles of movies he did after a while, he, he definitely leaned into the B-movie genre, it seemed. Um, <laughs> so, let me see. The Boy Who Cried Werewolf. I remember that. Octoman. I remember that. Yeah. Maniac, 1963. Um, um, no, you meant 1980. Like, what? <laughs> Octoman. Uh, no, he retired from acting in 78. Uh, moved to San Francisco where he ran a clothing and antique shop. He died in his sleep on, in, on July 5th, 2007. Uh, he had one partner in his entire life from 61 to 2007. And that was uh, someone they're saying here in the file named Tom Nicole. Mmm. So he like he was fabulous. <laughs> well, he lived in San Francisco doing clothing. Exactly. So he was very fabulous. <laughs> well, it's just amazing all the stuff you find out later. Like I had no idea that you know Perizzo was being played by Bing Crosby's wife. Man. Mm. Well, they that were, explains that explains how she got the part. They were married from fifty-seven to seventy-seven when Bing died. Um, she only took on a few smaller roles from that point on. Uh, she was in a short-lived Broadway musical in 96 called State Fair, but pretty much after that, she's kind of drops off the radar. Um, okay. All right. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. She, she did a lot of films all the way up to 59, including a voice for 1001 Arabian Nights. She was in Anatomy of a Murder in 59. Uh, but after that, she just kind of drops off the radar and disappears. Well, I think probably because she was having a family with Bing, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Likely, yeah, maybe she settled down to do the family life, you know? Because their daughter also shot Jr. in um in Dallas. Huh? Yeah. Mary Mary Crosby, I think that's oh, Bing. That that's another one. Oh, that yeah. Chris, Chris, Christy, yeah, or Christine or Christine, yeah. I know my my sister named my her cat after Chris, the gal that shot Jr. I'll never forget that because that cat lived to be like thirteen years old. And the punchline turned out to be after she had the cat for two years, it was a long hair. She found out it was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> a boy called Kristen. Exactly. Uh, during one summer when the uh, Kristen, a.k.a. female cat, shed an awful lot, turns out Kristen had balls. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to respect what Kristen's uh, life, life with things, <laughs> down to Chris after that for, you know, for the remainder of the kitty's life. Uh, well, yeah, also, like I said, Torrin Thatcher, like I said, he, he, you know, a lot of people know him from um, Star Trek, the original series, um, but when you go look at just his partial filmography, 
you know, after this, he did Jack the Giant Killer, Mutiny on the Bounty, The Sandpiper. Um, heck, he had movies going all the way back to 36. Well-respected British actor. I thought he was pretty good at Sakura. You know, he's kind of like a con man in this movie, you know? He's like, very conniving, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think like, as far as favorite characters go, his was my favorite character in this movie for that fact. Because he was so interesting and uh, touching back upon what we already said about just that stupidity of not realizing he's involved in the whole thing. Like, he just um, automatically seemed like the smartest dude in the room, you know? Yeah, I would agree <laughs> with you on that. It's interesting to watch for me. I kind of had a weird thing where, like, I'm looking at him and his mannerisms and the way he's conniving. I'm almost thinking Ainley Master to a certain degree. Like, I've <laughs> <laughs> yeah, been funny if he would have been played the master, huh? Mm. Yeah. Also, you got to remember that this film um, is preserved by the National Film Registry. And yes, Foreign uh, passed away in 1981 at the age of 76. Uh, right. uh. Matter of fact, I think. The only member of the principal cast I can find still alive is Barani the Genie, and he pretty much stopped acting acting after the age of 21, in which he appeared in his last acting role in the TV series Combat. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, you, would, you would have thought they would have overdubbed him a little bit because he had a really funny accent for a genie, didn't he? Oh, that's what I'm saying. Every time I, I listened to it, uh, I, I felt like I was watching a western because it was, it was, it was, it was, there was no, there, there was nothing very Pakistani about it. You know, what I mean, no disrespect to any, you know, Indians watching this, but you know, it was too English. Man, yeah. I remember it was, it was, it was the first um, that he did with the studio, so they, they probably had more control back then. So when he started doing the other movies, that's what you saw it do um, outside the United States, and he used a lot of those British and European actors. Yeah, yeah, you can tell this was his first exposure to this type of culture because you had references to thanking God and then this island is populated by, you know, it's under the control of Satan. I'm like, wait a minute, dude. <laughs> That's These true. guys are from Baghdad and they're talking about God and Satan? Wait, wait a minute, I thought they were all Muslims back then. You know, I'm like, wait, well, what? <laughs> like, where's Allah in this movie? <laughs> yeah. Only, only um, um, Simba's right-hand man actually said it when they went to, made it to the island. So, Pray to Allah that we get out of this safely. That's it. Yep. Selected in 2008 for preservation in the National Film Registry. Uh, matter of fact, um, the other the good notes on its reception down here is um, the seventh. All right. According to the notes here, and like I said, I, I have to hate to say this, but I, I took this off Wikipedia. I did double check later. Don't worry. <laughs> I did double check the footnotes on it. So this is true. The Seven Voyages Sinbad was and continues to be well reviewed by critics and audiences alike, with many saying it is the best film of the Sinbad trilogy. I don't know. To me, that was Eye of the Tiger, but that's my opinion. It has Golden a Voyage. Yeah, it has a 100% rating at the aggregate movie review site of uh, Rotten Tomatoes, and several reviewers have cited its nostalgic value. Mountain Express critic Ken Hunky says childhood memory stuff of the most compelling kind. And that's the way I kind of look at it when I sit back and watch this movie. Because when I watched it as a kid, this is like the stuff of fairy tales. This is stuff that really, really caught my eye. You know, the multi-arms, you know, snake woman, the cyclops, the dragon, you know. And that's what sticks in my memory when I go back and watch these movies is how I watched them as a kid versus how I watch them now you know, growing up a bit. Because when you're a kid, you're thinking, oh my God, it's like these are these cool places out there in the world. I got to go find this island, man. <laughs> This is almost as cool as Monster Island where Godzilla lives. <laughs> yeah. But now you sit back, you look on it, and you appreciate it for the artistic value, um, all the work that went into it, especially when we live in the age of CGI, you know, where I'm not saying it's not hard work, but a lot of the stuff's done by computer now or, you know, motion capture and things along that line, whereas back in those days, you literally had to do this frame by frame, and you so much as screw up once in that entire sequence – Congratulations, chuck that film out. You got to start over again from the beginning, you know. So it was a very, very different time back in '58 when they started doing this. Matter of fact, as he brought up in the one documentary, when they put out the movie King Kong, which was his inspiration for Harry Housen going on to do these movies, they kept it top secret on how they did it. They wouldn't tell anyone how the movie was made, so he had to find out the hard way, and that's where he fell in love with stop motion animation, and thus a legend was born. Okay, so anything else anyone wants to bring up about the Seven Voyages Sinbad? 
me mean besides the special effects? Oh, you know, anything else you noticed in it that you like, disliked, or anything like that? What's weird is that the dragon, um, we know it was stop motion. For some reason, he has like a pointy tail, like a like a spear. I gotta take him. I don't want to take him out. He can see. Oh, yeah. it. He got a weird tail, right here. Ooh. And then, yeah, and that's the way he looks in the movie. That he got he got like a spear. It's too bad he didn't use it on the second. Like he stabbed it with it, man. You see how it works. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. I just also read, and I can't you know, forgot to even mention this earlier. Um, they were eventually they were talking about having the dragon have the flame stuff come out of his mouth continuously during the fight sequences, but they said no, nah, it would have cost too much on the budget. So that's why they went against it. Yeah, it was um, it, it, the budget wasn't it wasn't a high budget. It made back a lot of money too. Yeah, that it did. You know, this is back in the days when you could film, you know, film a movie for under a few million and really rake in the cash. It wasn't even. It was only six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Ooh, okay, that's less than I imagine. I was looking it up. I couldn't find it anywhere. I don't know why. But but that was a lot of money back then, wasn't it? It's the yeah, same when you look at it in equivalent dollars, yeah. But compared to how much we're spending on a motion picture now, oh man, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars even back then that would have been staggering. Yeah, uh, and they back three and a half million right there in, in the United States alone. So you know, it made back his money and then some. Oh uh, yeah, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, a definite classic. Sure, it has its up point, it has its upbeats and its downbeats, but still an enjoyable movie to go back and watch every now and then. Like I said, I, I still prefer the other two films myself. You know, I, I, matter of fact, I, I really love Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. As much as I like Golden Voyage, I don't know. Something about Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger just seemed more magical. Maybe it was James. The side, yeah, the side, James the side book. Almost. <laughs> James Seymour. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't get any side boob in this movie. Yes. <laughs> 58. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and we'll go around. We'll rate this sucker out of 10. Let's start with William out of 10. How do you vo rate the seven voyages in there? I give it a nine and a half out of 10. All righty. Philip? Okay, you know what? It's not as bad as, as I thought it would be. So I'm going to give it um, a nine. I'm going to give it a nine. Okay, Tim? Well, I'm sure at the time, you know, I mean, if I'd been a kid in 1958 and went and saw this in the theater with my dad or mom, I would have loved it. And it, 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 that's, it is a product of its time, but it's a very good product of that time, I would say. So I would give it a 9 out of 10. Okay. And Johnny Blues? I'll echo everything everyone already said. I'll give it a 9. Okay. I have to go back to the little boy in me and give it. I, I'll agree with you all. I'll give it a 9 out of 10. I, I just try to look. When I watch this movie again, I'm always brought back to those times when I was, you know, just about maybe five, maybe six years old or seven or eight years old when it came out or, you know, when it came out on TV, you know, they'd show it on the late night theater or they'd show it on the weekend. And it was just always a magical time for me to sit down and watch these movies, but all good things come to an end. Uh, maybe we might be popping back on a few different movies later with the Harry Housen did, but for now we're going to close that chapter Next week, we start the movies of John Carpenter. Uh, we're going to start with They Live, starring Roddy Piper, Keith David. And I, I just think it's an interesting movie. It tells, a, you know, it wasn't the most fantastic movie of all time. And, yes, the fight sequence was really damn long. But at the same time, it did have an important message to it. And I think that message still stands true to this day, that maybe not all things in the world are as they appear. Okay, so I'm gonna have myself. I'm gonna go ahead and get everybody a, get a, go around, and get goodbyes from everyone. Let's start, William. Oh, thank you for having me here. And, and th those fans who still want to know about Harry Hansen, don't forget his book. And I can't be can't wait for next week's when we do the um, John Carpenter. All right, Philip. It's been a blast doing um, going through the life of Harry Hansen's films, and I'm looking forward to uh, they live. Oh, the next film. Yep. Okay, Texas Tim. Yeah, as always, thanks for having me. I look forward to next time. And Johnny Blues. Also, thanks for having me, and hope everyone has a great night. Okay, on behalf of myself and the rest of the panel, everyone enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next Saturday with They Live. Bye-bye.